when I look at your book um, for Captain Cook, you said the uh, the idea came from looking at a university library index card. Um, so that moment on, it takes a long time to kind of actually get go through life. How do you deal with long stretches of waiting or long stretches of not knowing what's going to happen? When is that going to happen? That must drive yeah. you kind of stir crazy. Well, it would do, but for the fact I don't ever do one thing at once. I am the most horrendous multitasker. So I'm always spinning a million plates. So if one isn't really spinning very fast, I've got other things to, to occupy myself. So yeah, I, as I said, I've always run my TV career and my academic career and my coaching career, always right from early doors. I've, I've done that, you know, from first, pretty much as soon as I left university, I've always had multiple projects on the go. So there is very little time to spend twiddling thumbs, I suppose. Uh, and the book itself, yeah, I mean, it was, the book came about when the first, my first book, Captain Cook, the biography, that I was working flat out on Tonight with Trevor McDonald. I was one of their five correspondents. I was going all around the world. And I just got to the point where I needed to, I wanted to deep dive into something. I think that's the other thing. When I'm spinning lots of plates, you want to go deep and just take a pause point and really do a job well. I'm a horrific perfectionist. So I get, I don't like skimming over things. I always feel incomplete if I've skimmed over things. So I wanted to deep dive into a project and the book. Yeah, I was actually tramping in New Zealand and said to my partner, now husband, like, this is totally un unsustainable. And he was like, what are you talking about? I said, this life, this life. I've, I've worked for something like 50 odd days on the trot, one day off, then another 48, I think it was. I did three periods with literally about a day in between that took me through months and months and months of work. So I'd made the decision to kind of step off the merry-go-round and focus on the book. And I'd written the book, wrote the book, researched the book very, very quickly, but then had to wait a good few years before making the TV programme. So I think the first book came out in 2001, was it? Mm. And I had to wait until 2006 to go into production making the TV series because things like the Twin Towers mm. um, disaster happened on the day that I was meant to be signing a contract with um, a, a big global broadcaster. So things happen and, but you know, things always have a habit of working out if you've made the connections, you've done the work and if it's the right project, it'll eventually come your way and happen I think so yeah the book did take a very long time but I I'm not the kind of person that sits around getting bored I sometimes wish I could because I think it would be lovely to be, be calm and mindful where does that motivation come from is it from any kind of role model or from your own experience of knowing things will happen you know how do how does one train um, to be that resilient hmm um, I think by spreading risk, so I've, as I say, I've always got multiple projects on the go. So if one doesn't happen, it's not, it's, it can be really sad and upsetting, but it's not, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't define me. Yeah. Um, you know, one project doesn't define me. When somebody says, what do you do? I'm like, I find that answer really hard to give because I don't know how to define what I do, because it's never neatly sat in one silo. I've always done the writing, the broadcasting, the coaching, the academic research. So it's, yeah, I, I think that makes you resilient, doesn't it? Mm. If you spread your risk, you know, you take away one part of my life, well, I've still got lots of other things. Mm. Um, and, and I think by trying, I, by trying, um, a lot as well because from experience you know well that's just a glitch or you know it may not happen today but further down the line I know that my experience will be valuable even if it's not for this project it will be for something else yeah um, and and I also think you know the resilience also comes from having really good people around you as I, I've already talked about the importance of mentors in my life but I've always had most of my friends outside of television 
and they don't care what I do. So I've got huge numbers of friends from my childhood. Again, they don't care. I was just messy messy to them and I always will be. So they don't care that allegedly more glamorous parts of my life, although anyone who knows television knows it isn't as glamorous as it seems. You're up at bonkers o'clock in taxis, hotels, airports, and then back on <laughs> taxis, hotels and airports. Um, so yeah, I think having very good friends and family is really important. And I, I'm quite good at nurturing my networks. I, I do keep in contact with people. I make a lot of effort. I invest a lot in the people I love and the people I respect. So yeah, I think that also helps with resilience as well. Well, talk about keeping in touch. Um, I remember the reason why we kind of managed to keep in touch over these um, the almost decade um, was that I got an email uh, in 2016. Um, I was doing a, a talk um, at the British Council exploring the idea of how digital lifestyle reshape our brain. So I was talking about the kind of cognitive neuroscience part. And then one day I received an email from the event organizer saying, hey, there's one email for, for you. And I was thinking, what? <laughs> and it was from you. So you told me that you went back to Scotland and, but you were still in the uh, um, Café Scientifique uh, newsletter emails. Mm -hmm. And so you saw my name and I said, oh, it's wonderful that you've now changed jobs. And if you ever want to come to Glasgow and do this again, you know, please let me know. Um, so important, I think, sometimes when you think you're just doing this lone thing that no one cares about. Um, and even for friends, you know, they don't, you know, really kind of praise you all the time. Uh, kind of little successes um, but actually some people actually do look at what you've done and even if some people don't say it out loud um, they are watching so I think that was you know one of my experiences that whatever you do you need to do your best because you never know what's going to um, be the impact um, so how did you get involved in science I growing up when I was really tiny, I wanted to be a forensic scientist. I wanted to be a forensic chemist. I was so bad at chemistry. Um, obviously, that was uh, just kind of it. I'd seen a picture of a forensic scientist and it looked really interesting at the time. I could never, I've got quite a kind of split brain. I, I could never decide if I was an artist or a scientist. As I said, I love the arts. I love music, English drama, all of this kind of thing. But I also have a really nerdy side that I love. Um, big concepts in science that are really hard to understand often. So I loved, always loved that, that messy complexity of, of science. And that's why I read geography, because you do half human and half physical, uh, well, certainly it did in the Oxford course. So it suited me down to the ground because I could do drainage basin hydrology and erosion one minute and then do something like well, fertility regulation. Um, uh, but even in fertility regulation, I was doing ethnobotany. I was looking at traditional plant use, which was absolutely fascinating. So I've always had those two things that schools like to keep very separate, but I never really saw the, the distinction, I suppose, between them. And I sort of kept those going along. Um, How did you get involved in uh, running a cafe science? science? Yeah, so I'd always, even though I ended up being slightly more of a human geographer, I'd always kept that sort of science interest going. And I ended up being a science correspondent when Channel 5 started up and met this absolutely brilliant guy who was my one of my few male mentors, a guy called Duncan Dallas. And he lived opposite a wine bar. He was brilliant. He had one genius idea a day. He would turn up to a six week edit on a, with literally a piece of paper this big with a few notes scribbled on it. He held it all in his head. He actually was a chemist by background. And he decided that what we needed, it was during the era of Frankenstein foods, you know, genetic modification and, you know, sort of science and the public, and BSE, that's the other thing. Scientists and the public were getting further and further apart. So Duncan was like, well, what can we do to bring them together? I know, I'll just run a science 
cafe in the wine bar opposite my house. So I think the first one he had was Oliver Sacks, you know, the internationally acclaimed kind of, um, you know, scientist who would, you know, the man who mistook his wife for a hat and all of this kind of brilliant, brilliant um, guy. And he came along and he was a friend. I think he was his children's godfather, actually. Um, and I think he, he came along and just stood there and did a little 20 minute introduction. Then we had a question and answer session. And I was lucky enough to be at, at that cafe. And I was blown away by the potential of, I suppose it, it reunites, doesn't it? The intellectual interest area, but with that performative, interactive, social, lovely, warm exchange of ideas from the public. And I logged that and I always wanted to set one up. So in 19, 2004, I eventually set one up in Glasgow uh, with a colleague of mine. Um, and that's still running today. I was hosting it last night. And then when I went to Hong Kong, I was like, I'm really intellectually a little bit bored. I need some ideas. I need something happening. So um, I got together with a group of people, a um, couple of women from my book club and um, a fantastic guy from the museum who I'd got to know through my mathy, nerdy kind of little community, lovely guy, brilliant. Another like brain the size of a planet, this guy. And we set up the one in Hong Kong. And then when I came home, they continued it. I think it's changed now to another group of people running, but it's still going strong. And I just think, that's such a gift that Duncan Dallas had given the world, really. There are hundreds of Café Scientifiques all over the world now. And during lockdown, because we're all virtual, it's been great because we've all hopped in and out of one another's cafes. And I've made, again, some really lovely friends across the world doing this. And you don't get paid for it. It takes up a lot of time, but you know, it is so worth it. And it keeps me invested into ideas in science which is what i really love so yeah it's i i will never let science go mm. even though i'm kind of an accidental scientist because really i'm a fake scientist because geographers don't think anyone really sort of respects geographers as real scientists no i, I, I think, think because but... it's it's great to kind of not think about these two worlds as something very different um, the kind of art side and the science part. Um, and I actually read a little bit uh, of your thesis. Um, and I put. Good Lord. You, you must be I... the, um, after my supervisor <laughs> and me, and maybe the examiners. You're probably the only one who has. I, d I downloaded it from, from the University of Glasgow. <laughs> um, and I particularly like your um, guess what? Um, research objectives. Um, and I like it how you said in, um, uh, in that section that one of your methodology was to construct and interrogate the publications that were um, uh, archived at the time of Captain Cook's um, voyages. And I like the word that you use, interrogate, which is very powerful. And um, for academics is acceptable and even kind of deemed necessary to do that and actually in science I was working on um, next generation sequencing and we actually had that term interrogating DNA sequences um, uh, as a technique but no one is going to think that scientists are going to waterboard DNA or RNAs but when you use that in kind of other contexts it becomes a really hostile word to, to say so in your experience how do you balance between being nice, you know, being nice, having a conversation, but also interrogating the truth of things, interrogating um, uh, a person. I don't know that you have to put their feet um, to the fire, really. What, when I was interviewing people, I'm trying, to, my skill as an interviewer is to get them to open up of themselves, but for also me to be reading all their body language, listening to the verbal language, but also just reading everything that's going on to construct meaning, to try and interrogate the whole presence. So somebody can say, I'm really confident, but you know from the body language they're not, or of course I did that, and you know they didn't. Um, and so really, it's that very complex ecosystem that I 
um, absolutely at home in. Incidentally, what I would say is everyone should be a geographer because they're exactly the skills we need to understand this very messy, complicated world. We need a kind of systems approach. You can't do one thing in isolation, whereas science does try to do one thing in isolation to, to make that rigorous, but we kind of, you know, need to build lots of different things all going on at once often. Um, so in terms of interrogating people, I think, well, A, I'm a perfectionist and I'm very tenacious, so I don't give up. But also I have a variety of skills that I can draw on just from, I suppose, some of it just from my basic personality, but some of it just from 30 years, can you believe 30 years of interviewing people professionally. So you just learn to read everything that's coming your way, you know, by sound, by visuals, by mood, by atmosphere, literally everything. You're, you're picking up so many clues. So you don't need to stick people's feet in the fire. You need to often just actually stand back and let them venture forth with their, what they say consciously, but also what they're saying unconsciously. Mm. I remember um, meeting you, I think, uh, for, again, the Seldom Map in Hong Kong. Um, we met at a, a coffee shop in Central in Galleria. And, I, and um, we were told that you had four children, all boys, at a young age. And then you just kind of walked in with this kind of sleeveless red dress in the summer. Um, red hair, and I thought there was this um, princess from Brave, the uh, cartoon yes, animation, yeah. just kind of come yeah. out from nowhere. Um, but it's, it's just kind of s such a kind of different um, image uh, in our mind from someone who is a journalist, who is a broadcaster, but at the same time a mother um, moved to Hong Kong um, for, for a couple of years. How did that experience um, change you, if at all? The Hong Kong experience? Yeah. I suppose I have never liked to be put in a box. So even before I got to Hong Kong, I like to confound people's expectations. So if they expected a kind of power dressing, sort of hard-nosed journo to walk through the door, and lots of politicians did expect that, I would go in all bright and bubbly and with my fluffy hair and say, oh, is that a lovely picture of your dog? Oh, that's gorgeous. So they then trade on their stereotypes and lead themselves up a garden path by thinking that I'm some kind of brain dead ditzy person <laughs> who's going to just say, oh, hello, how are you? And then of course, so I do all this act before, before we sat down and lull them into a false sense of security. And if they were remotely kind of sexist or arrogant or entitled, I would go, right, how do you explain this kind of thing? And I, I would interrogate them that way, going back to our previous question. But in terms of Hong Kong, it was weird because I had, had just had my fourth child. He was literally just four weeks when we emigrated. And I'd always worked all the way through. I literally gave up work I finished, I was doing a Radio 4 history series called Making History and we finished on the Friday, literally the Friday night and flew out on the Saturday. So I had gone from being a working mother, a like a really bonkers hard working mother, to going to Hong Kong, I didn't have a job. I was officially known as a trailing spouse, which is a ghastly, ghastly title, isn't it? Um, well, in, in Hong Kong, we probably think of you as an expat Tai Tai. So you yeah, do totally. nothing and just do kind of like man, many yeah. caddies. Yes, I, I don't I do not do the spa treatment. I don't do the champagne and spa lifestyle at all. Um, so I got to Hong Kong and thought, I'm going to make the most of this. Oh my word, six weeks later, I walked into RTHK with my CV printed out in a poly pocket. <laughs> saying, Can I have a job, please? I was rough. I was the world's worst expat. Um, <laughs> I really was the most appalling. Give, give me a job, give me a job. It, oh, yeah, so I didn't get my house design, interior designed. I had bonkers children that just created chaos wherever they went. Um, yeah, I didn't dress right. I realized the first day I took my then two year old to um, number three child to the nursery, I turned up in jeans, trainers, a fleece with vomit, you know, baby sick on, from the baby over the shoulder. And as I got out my car and put the baby over my shoulder to 
walk the other one up the steps to nursery. I looked around and there was, no kidding, a lady in gold high heels and a silk dress holding the hand of this beautifully tidy child. Um, and my kids kind of still had snot in their hair, bits of breakfast cereal, you know, it was like, yeah. And it was just like, oh, there's a whole different set of rules and codes over here. But that in itself was really interesting because it's kind of I, like condensed I, version, you know, of yeah. some sort, you know, it's not Hong Kong, you know, and it's not English. It, it's a kind of weird hybrid, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But I could confound the, the expectations and stereotypes about expats to other expats. And then I did things like I joined a local choir um, of mainly local women. So, and then I worked as well. So I, I managed to somehow get through it did take up it took two years for me to find my feet and then in that second year that's when i got the cafe sion tafik um beginning to get up and running and i was working at the university as well i met a lovely woman professor julia coon there and she got me office space in one of the offices there so i was researching my phd giving the odd kind of talk and stuff at the university, researching my radio series and doing all of that from a base at the university, but at least I was with real people. Um, yeah, I was the biggest failure as a glam Tai Tai expat. Uh, I can't do spas. I don't spend Play tennis. <laughs> Obviously. Um, yeah, I did learn to play tennis. Oh. I was pre I played tennis as a child, so I love playing tennis. But my instructor, a Chinese man called Andy, he was like, oh, you're very aggressive on the tennis court. <laughs> like, yes, I am, I love it. I want to exercise, I want to get better. So I think he was used to kind of expat ladies. Just yeah, kind of, it's just know. on the way to uh, afternoon tea, you know, you just kind of yeah, hit a few yeah. balls. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's not a no. sport, <laughs> it's yeah. a social so, gathering. So Hong Kong was really good, but what it did teach me was I don't fit in a very conventional glam life. I like getting my boots dirty. So I, when we came home, I always used to say when I came home, I could breathe. Um, I, I live on a farm. I, I, I like the countryside and I miss those open green spaces that are so important to me. I mean, sort of you asked me to send you some photographs mm. of things and it was Brilliant. so funny looking a I'm not in any of my family photographs because I'm always the one behind the lens so I'm not I almost don't exist my children are going to think or my grandchildren if I ever get any will think that I did not exist I was entirely absent from my children's life because I'm always behind the camera but when I was looking through them all of my photographs are of hiking walking climbing I love sort of hike like serious hiking in the mountains. My kids, I've got so many pictures of them. Um, I've probably sent you some for, for, yeah. for selecting that of kids like, oh, she's dragged us up yet another mountain. We emerged out of lockdown and I took my kids um, climbing in the Tatra Mountains in Poland um, instead of lying on a beach and they weren't very impressed. Um, and then uh, sort of this summer, we went climbing in Scotland. We climbed up Shahali and even with the little ones, the little ones can manage it, they're fine. Um, you just feed them lots of sweeties along the way. Thank goodness for Haribo's, is all I can say. But yeah, if you get into a good conversation, you're walking, you're climbing, you're chatting, you're looking around, taking photographs, having fun, laughing, uh, or singing. There's a lot of singing goes on in our house where my kids are. Oh. Are they the kids? <laughs> for, so that was, for baritones. Sorry, that was, oh, that was actually the. The man who last night discovered one of my children's school bags on a train at 11 o'clock at night. Um, How do you manage doing all these things at the same time? So well, the practical, okay, practically break it down for us. Okay, so um, I normally wake up early. I'm a horrible uh, insomniac, so I'm normally awake five, six o'clock. I try not to get up always at that time, but that's often the time that I get peace and quiet. Um, but you so, sleep so oh, late. I, 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 Sorry? I, I messaged you at 1 a.m. and you're still on or something. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not a great sleeper. Never have been, actually, to be fair. Um, and I'm a real night owl. The trouble is now I'm also a morning person as well, which doesn't really work so well. <laughs> but but um, A, I like to be busy. I need headspace, and for that I need silence sometimes. And that I get my headspace 
in the wee small hours of the morning or the early hours of the, of the five, six o'clock kind of thing. So that's how I think I manage time. I just don't really sleep that much. Um, and Do you have I, lists when of things to do? Oh, oh, if I could show you my kitchen now. So during lockdown, I've got these big walls covered in perspex that we write on. And I had a big board, it's still up now actually, it's called Evil Ness's Homeschool. And I had like a boot camp regime for my children. So we were all up at seven, showered, washed, dressed, eight o'clock, go for a, an hour long hike up a hill. Uh, I'm, I'm in, in the Scottish countryside, we've got plenty of hills all around us. Walk the dog, pick up litter. We picked up 16 sacks of litter along the foreshore of the loch that I live on during lockdown, which I'm quite proud of my children for that. They didn't have a lot of option though, because it was like, here's a litter picker up and let's make this fun. Um, <laughs> and then we were back like nine o'clock, they had half an hour's literacy. I would make the mid-morning snacks, like cook a flapjack or something, then do some homeschooling with them. Then they'd have a morning break. Then during the morning break, I would be making the lunch. So I'm a planner. I'm a, I always know what needs to happen. And that's the trouble. I, I'm planning in my head, hours ahead. So I would sort of ha construct the whole day like that. And then at three o'clock when homeschool was finished, I would go into the office and do start my eight hour day or whatever. So yeah, it was, it's, life's pretty 24 hours, I would say for sure. Looking at all these experiences and the kind of people that you've met, you've done so much. So what kind of um, assumptions still, still surprises you when they say, oh yeah, you must, you know, just be a TV presenter. Okay. So I, as I said earlier, really hate being put in a box. And I had a bit of an issue with that. I'd never massively encountered it in television other than the gender thing. Oh, you're too young and frou-frou to be a serious journalist, or you're too young, or you're too old to do this kind of job, or, you know, this kind of nonsense, or, oh, you don't look like a scientist was one thing I had. And actually that's how I ended up moving more into history because my specialism was climate change. And nobody wanted to know about that, um, really, until the last few years. Nobody really wanted to make programming or, or learn too much about that. There were still climate deniers. Mm -hmm. So I then switched to history. I, I think you just have to adapt. When I went to do my, belatedly went to do my PhD, I had real problem in some parts of academia, not other mature women, but being a mature woman going back into studying, and especially being a journalist, the instant assumption was you are not rigorous, you're not actually serious about what you're doing. Because, you know, I had four kids, I was writing books at the same time, I was making TV series, I had a couple of quite serious illnesses while I was doing my PhD as well. And so it, it what I did have a very non-traditional route um, and it really bugged me when um, one person in particular said you're not serious it's like I am serious I just have a very busy life and I do a lot of things very intensely um, anyway you know it was fine I got my PhD and got it in the end but that was a hard lesson in challenging stereotypes but then you see you've got age and gender which in some more traditional minds is a bit of a stumbling block. Mm. So how did that lead on to coaching? Because that was when I uh, then reciprocate by reaching out to you and say, hey, you may not remember me, but I was oh, Googling yeah. to search for someone doing something about the law. And then there was your face right next to my um, law tutor. And I thought, huh, so Ness is now coaching lawyers. How did that happen? Um, so I okay, reached out to you. I, I'd, al I'd always coached. So I, right from the earliest days in television, a, somebody came to me, a kind of friend came along and said, oh, I've got a friend who's coaching, uh, who's got some, some of his uh, colleagues pitching for a really big contract, but it's not going very well. Could you come and help them with the public speaking, the presentation side? I'm like, yeah, that sounds great fun. So I went along and started doing that for a company called J and J Denham in Glasgow, a huge international shipping um, company. Well, mo lots of interests they've got now, but it grew from there, and I absolutely love. I suppose when you're working in TV, mm. there's a 
glass screen, isn't there, between you and your audience. When you're coaching, other than in these COVID times, you've got people right there in front of you. And I love that. I'm curious about people. I love working out what makes people tick. And so the coaching just grew organically. And so I always ran the coaching alongside the TV. I would do take two thirds of my time TV, a third of my time coaching. It's kind of flipped around now. Um, and I'm more coaching than, than doing um, TV and books. But the, that, the, the coaching with lawyers came about because I was back at an old university reunion, met one of my rowing, old rowing friends from my year at, at college. And I asked her what she was up to. And she said, oh, I'm running, this, what I'm running a, a legal training company, um, keeping people up to date on advances in the law and things like that. And then she said, what am I doing? So I said about the TV and about the coaching side. She was like, oh, I could really use somebody to do the communication skills side of things. So I was like, well, yeah, let's talk. And so we started talking and then we realized that actually I could do a lot of the stuff that she was needing. And what I didn't know to do then, I learned how to do um, the more kind of legal end of things. And it's really fascinating. You're working with phenomenally smart people who learn very quickly. So as a coach, it's a joy to train and work with these and coach these people because they're all very, very smart and they learn very quickly and they want to be swift and efficient. And I'm, I love working in like, let, we need to get this done. We've got an hour to get this done. Or we've got two hours or three hours to get this done. Let's just do it. So what are the kind of things that surprises you when smart people like the people that you coach still have this kind of obstacle in their head and go, oh, I didn't know that. And suddenly it goes ping. You know, are there moments when you think that must be kind of quite obvious to you why your communication is just a little bit short? I have had the privilege of uh, the downside as well of having had a career where I have had to sit down and not just look at myself but assess myself if i had done an interview that hadn't gone very well i would look back and think what did i do wrong and learn from it but that's a privilege that not many people have this continual learning development kind of lifelong learning in its in its essence really most people do a job and they don't have that uh, that opportunity to look in on themselves performing mm. and so what my job is to be that second set of eyes and say hang on a sec this was really successful because but this diminished your impact because and what i love about the impact coaching is it's not rocket science um lots of people haven't connected the dots before but when you say people just try this and it works it's like oh my word it's so easy but they, it's just having somebody say, you try this. And you can't get it from a, a manual because everybody is different. Everybody needs adjusting in slightly different ways. So last um, last week, the week before last, I was working on a residential, my first residential post COVID. And I had 10 fantastic people, but every single one of those 10 people was very different with very different needs. So what I'm doing is sucking up a huge amount of information from them and then tweaking them according to what they need, not just a kind of cookie cutter approach. You've got to work in this dynamic system, this ecosystems approach that I was talking about earlier, mm. where everything influences everything else. So you change a few things and suddenly the whole system lifts and becomes much more efficient. So what are you working on lately? So still doing lots of coaching. I do lots and lots of hosting of events. I still have got a few things developing in TV. Mm. I wrote my first poem published this year, which is very scary because poetry has always been something I've, I've loved, but I've never let anyone read anything that I've done before. Um, so yeah, and I've, I've taught poetry um, quite often at workshops and things like that. But to have, it was my old English teacher contacted me and asked me to do something from years and years ago. And he's a publisher now. And so yeah, that's in process now. Um, and her, it's made me think actually I got so much enjoyment out of doing that I think it's probably time that I did another writing project um, what form it'll be who knows it could be poetry it could be could so be exciting that every time I kind of catch <laughs> um, up with you there is some kind of something new and 
um, it keeps me motivated. If you have to be someone for a week, um, who dead or alive, who do you want to be? That's such a difficult question. I mean, I'm kind of going my... to kind of like psychoanalyze you, you know, with that question. Mm. So. <laughs> I think you see, I might want to be Boudicca. Obviously, I wrote a biography, and it's always dangerous when you have somebody who you find fascinating and you write a biography about them. You don't want to exhaust and then get bored by them ultimately. But I've been so lucky that the people I've written biographies on have, have endlessly enthralled me. And Boudicca is one of those people. Same with James Cook. I can never learn enough about James Cook. I can never learn enough about Boudicca. Um, and Boudicca, I would love to be her with the benefit of hindsight understanding the context of what the Romans were trying to do at the time to see if we could alter history and see how interesting it would be if she had driven the Romans out of Britain. I think that would have been fantastic. I'd love to know what happened to her in, in her final hours, but to have avoided the well, what the Roman historians wrote about her final hours, to have avoided that battle, I think I think she could have done that. And I think, wouldn't it be interesting to kind of run a what if version of history? So yeah, I'd love to do that. I would have loved to do that. Well, I, I'd love to see what you are going to do next. So thank you very much, Ness, for um, speaking so frankly about your experiences. And I am very sure that you are more than just a TV broadcaster. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mimi. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs>